Hey, good day, everyone. Welcome to Aerospace Live. Now, if you've been in aviation, then our guests truly do not need any introductions. But if you are brand new, let me introduce you to John and Martha King from the King Schools. Now, the King Schools is a school that has been focused on helping pilots learn the knowledge portion of their flight, safety, and equipment training. John and Martha have really been all in in the aviation community, trying to drive the skills that will make pilots safer. Now, John and Martha founded the King Schools more than four and a half decades ago, back in 1975. Not to make them feel old, but that was the year I was born. <laughs> um, they started by giving ground schools while traveling to different cities and then moved into video production. Now, their use of green screen technology back then was revolutionary. And frankly, these videos from nearly 30 years ago can still be an inspiration to those of us involved in online training today. Their flight instruction videos have grown incredibly over that time, and they now have self-study courses that cover pretty much all of the ratings and certificates that you would be likely looking for. Now, they have grown to more than 50 employees in their headquarters in Montgomery Field, which is near San Diego, California, and they have their own in-house digital studio. All of this has made John and Martha two of the most recognized flight instructors in the world, and for what it's worth, it's their video series that I personally use to pass my private, instrument, and commercial knowledge tests. It's also what I plan to use to help me with my CFI this year. Now, Martha and John have offered to present their straight talk about aviation safety discussion, which we're going to do directly after our normal guest interview. So just make sure you stay on for that. Now, lastly, if you're a member in good standing in Civil Air Patrol, you can get a substantial discount that John and Martha are very gracious to offer our organization. I'll throw a link to more information about that down in the description below. And with that, let's bring on John and Martha. John, Martha, how are you doing? We're doing fine. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I know you guys are very busy and uh, I want to say thank you very much for taking time to speak with us here at Civil Air Patrol. Uh, we really do appreciate that. And thank you for everything that you do in aviation in general. Well, Civil, Civil Air Patrol is a great contributor to the world community. It's uh, uh, far beyond just aviation. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You, you should be very proud of being a part of Civil Air Patrol. Yeah, I think we've had uh, we've now had our second largest deployment ever since um, World War II, uh, based off of COVID. Um, so we've been doing right. a lot of work. Um, yeah. So now what I did is a little different this time. Now, usually I have a bunch of questions that I have. Um, I've been trying to grow community. Now I have um, a group of folks I talk to on a forum called Pilots of America. And so I specifically said, you know what, instead of asking them questions that I have questions on, I'm gonna see what the community might have also have questions on. So I got a lot of these questions from them. Um, and frankly, their questions are, were better than mine. So, um, so, so I'm gonna go with the community. Um, so now we got this question from uh, 455 Bravo Uniform. Uh, I'm sure his name is Mike or something, um, but he goes by 455 Bravo Uniform. Now, um, now he was saying, you know, people like they get their private license and then they get their instrument license and it definitely helps them to become better and safer. Now, did you feel that um, if somebody was never gonna be for hire, do you feel that somebody going on for their commercial um, would be valuable um, in their pilot improvement? Oh, you're, the question is: Would would does it make being a commercial pilot make you a better pilot? Yeah, is it worthwhile if you're never going to be a for hire pilot to go on for your commercial? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, the uh, the the whole commercial certificate and the check ride and the knowledge that you do is all about uh, being a master. The, ready to be pilot in command and being able to be master of the aircraft. And uh, it, it just abso absolutely it improves your ability to fly the aircraft and improves your ability to identify and mitigate risks. It's just absolutely, you owe, it, you owe it to the people who are going to fly with you. Well, let me throw one more thing on to that, John. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you, the last thing you did was your instrument rating. Um, the commercial is a very physical, eyes out the window, uh, look how beautifully I can physically fly this airplane. It's, and it's flying gracefully. Gracefully. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. And interestingly enough, Bob, one of the things that, that actually getting a commercial certificate does, even if you're not ever going to fly commercially, is it makes sure that you don't accidentally stumble into uh, doing something that the FAA says is a commercial operation when you d aren't certificated for it and don't have the uh, operator's uh, certification 
for it. So uh, what you're saying is it helps you understand what you can legally do and it, what you can't it let, do. It helps you understand the rules uh, about what constitutes commercial operation and uh, operational control of the aircraft and so on, as opposed to having fun on a trip with your friends, which mm -hmm. we all do a lot and yeah. enjoy very much. But it's a, it's a, it's a, a, flying commercially, flying the commercial maneuvers is a thing of grace and beautiful, a, a beauty. It's just very smooth, very beautiful, and very graceful. And just, it's just, it's fun. It's just a lot of fun. And for those of you in CAP that are pilots, just a quick FYI, there are some things, if you're a new pilot for CAP, there are some flight activities you can't do unless you are a commercial pilot. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you're inside of CAP, because it actually still breaks those FAA regulations you were talking about. Yeah. Now, in addition to the commercial, um, is there any other certificates or endorsements that you think are good for general aviation pilots to pursue? Oh, instrument rating. Uh, it is just impossible to... Uh, to fly an airplane in, in in instrument meteorological meteorological conditions by looking outside the window, and the attempt to fly IMC while looking outside the window is lethal, and uh, and it's and and if you want to go out and kill yourself in an airplane, <laughs> an easy way to do it is to try and fly uh, IFR in, in uh, or VFR in, IM, in, in IMC conditions. And, and to to add on to that. If all you want to do is is go up at your home airport and and have uh, you know do takeoffs and landings and take a friend or two around the pattern, you don't need an instrument rating for that. But if you're going to use a general aviation airplane for any significant uh, transportation cross country at all, you really need that uh, instrument rating. Uh, you owe it to your passengers uh, to give them that standard of, of care and consideration and, and capability. You know, what happened to Kobe Bryant mm -hmm. is this very, very experienced helicopter pilot uh, was flying in low ceilings and low visibilities and wound up inside the clouds and lost control of the aircraft. And um, a very experienced helicopter pilot, but you just, I don't care how experienced you are, you can't fly uh, in IMC by looking outside the window. Yeah, we see so many accidents that are strictly caused by that. Um, and I, I honestly, I come from Rochester, New York, and it's um, it's always cloudy in Rochester, New York, right? So uh, we get more snow than Alaska <laughs> in Rochester, New York. <laughs> and um, so I've always told people, I, I always felt that your instrument rating was almost like a you have to have it, um, at least in that area. I mean, it's so cloudy and the clouds are so low that... And, and it's always good too, is like when you're on the ground and you're looking up and you see the dark, dreary clouds while there's a beautiful sunshine just above them. Um, yes. And you just got to know how to get up there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. One other thing, one other uh, rating that I would add uh, that I think is very useful, um, forget about being a commercial pilot, is uh, a tailwheel checkout. Mm-hmm. And the reason that I think that that's so valuable, one, again, it's a lot of fun, but number two, it really makes you aware of the wind all the time because, uh, you know, the, the saying they have about flying a tail dragger is that the flight's not over until you're in your tie down spot and the airplane is tied down because it has a mind of its own and in much of any kind of wind. So you get really very good at being wind aware and that makes you a much better pilot no matter what you're flying. You know, they, um, I flew a Waco one time and um, the guy gave me the controls and I thought we were all good and we got a little bit of a gust of wind. Um, we were only going maybe five knots, you know, not even uh, taxiing. And that was the scariest part of the whole flight. <laughs> when I felt, the, felt yes. the back of the, the back of the tail start moving on me. At that, at that point, you've got yourself in a situation um, where you don't have enough speed to have any control, mm -hmm. uh, not enough air over the rudder to give you control and just the dynamics of a, a tail dragger aircraft, um, they are just very susceptible as you saw to any kind of wind gusts. Yeah, that's a really good one. I hadn't thought about that. That's a really good recommendation. 
Now, going on to some of the airplanes, um, uh, this, this question is coming from a gentleman named Zeldman. Zeldman. I'm sure his name is Matt. Um, so um, he wanted to know, for student pilots, what would you, do you recommend buying their own airplane, say, after 10, 15, 20 hours, after they realize that this is something that they're going to want to do? Do you recommend buying their, buy somebody buying their own airplane? Well, it's a, it's a matter of your financial situation. We did it and got great satisfaction out of it and use it for our personal transportation. Um, we actually bought it <coughs> before we had any lessons right. uh, oh, well. <laughs> because it was a passion that John had had for a long time. And um, well, you'd had some lessons yeah. in high school. Yeah, we learned to fly it together right. and had a wonderful time with the aircraft. And, um, uh, it, 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 one of the nice things, really nice things about owning your own airplane when you learn to fly, <clears throat> if it works financially without pressure and so on, because you don't want to be pressured to shortchange the maintenance. Well, and you don't want to hate the airplane. Either. That's true. That's true. You want to love each other every time you go out oh, to it. <laughs> uh, one of the really great things is that because you do control the maintenance, you can be sure of the condition that it's in. You're the one that parked it in that spot or that hangar uh, yesterday afternoon or evening. You're the one that's going to fly it first thing this morning. Nobody has been abusing it, um, uh, beating it up. Other uh, than working, you. Other than you. <laughs> I, I agree. There were. I remember we... There uh, were times when we abused it with our right, landings. Right. Our, our landing, we bought a Cherokee 140 to learn to fly in. And um, it, it was a great airplane for that, uh, as is a, a Cessna 172. Um, but some of my landings, I, I really cringed because it was our airplane and we were doing it to <laughs> our airplane. But uh, it sometimes, depending on the aviation resources available in your area, owning your own airplane can give you a much higher comfort level about um, the quality of the maintenance. In case there's any confusion about this, I want to make it clear. Martha's only a little bit better pilot than I am. <laughs> we, I, I will say, we have a question later on about that that people wanted to ask. So, but I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll wait right. till we get to everything else before before you hang up on me with that question. Um, so that's that's good to know. Yeah, I've always liked too is the fact that you know if you wanted to go someplace, like you know every year I let you know Oshkosh, right? So. It's really difficult if you're renting an airplane to say, "Hey, I want to take the airplane for four or five days," and it's an air, you know, it's a school. Um, let's see here. So the next one I got his. I'm assuming his name is Ron because he goes by Flying Ron. So hello, Flying Ron. Um, all right, I know nothing about this one, so I'm hoping that this is something you can talk about in video. If not, we'll edit this out. Um, but John, this one is I think specifically for you. What okay. is the sick sack story? <laughs> well, that goes back a long yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, we were we were flying uh, across the Southern California desert, and um, in this uh, Cherokee, in 140. this Cherokee, and um, Martha says, "I and uh, I I need to land because I I got to go to the bathroom." And I said, "Have you looked outside the window? There is a <laughs> dust storm going on." Uh, there's dust all over the place. Can oh, you no. imagine that dust going through the engine of the aircraft, the, the plexiglass, the windows? Uh, I said, we are not going to go down through this dust storm <laughs> just because you have to go to the bathroom. I said, use a six hat. <laughs> and she says, well, I still have to go to the bathroom. And uh, uh, so she wound up using the six sack, and we didn't didn't drip all over the aircraft, and it worked out fine. Uh, but that's except, the six sack. Well, except. Oh, no, yeah, and then she got done with it, and then she hands it to me, <laughs> and she says it leaks. Oh no. Oh yes. So so I I, I, I figured he told me to use it, so I should just hand it to yeah, him. So I see this kind of vent window, and I get it up to the next that went vent window, and it goes whap all over the air. Oh. oh. I wasn't expecting that story. I thought this was going to be something else. Okay. <laughs> That's so pretty good. One of the morals to that story is always carry two six sacks. <laughs> Uh, I think my wife and me would have an argument at that point about who's pilot in command. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
She wasn't happy about it. <laughs> um, all right. So on that note, coming back to more of a training type question, uh, you know, um, and this is actually a two first. So um, I got one question that's uh, from Mooney Driver 78 and another uh, gentleman um, who was a skydiver called Jump Master. Um, and they're, they're kind of related. So Mooney Driver 78 is asking, um, you know, is there any way CFIs that we have to really think about or, or students ways that they have to think about as we transition in general aviation as a whole is transitioning from glass to uh, or from steam to glass, um, to analog to the digital. Um, I, I don't. Uh, there, there's a little bit more to learn on glass and 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 uh, uh, how it operates, but you're doing basically the same thing with either one. Um, the glass is actually, in my opinion, much easier to fly because. If you're looking at steam gauges, particularly for instruments, you have to build a three-dimensional picture inside your head of what's going on around you, the terrain, the weather, um, uh, the, the navigation aids. <laughs> the uh, attitude of the aircraft. Right, the attitude of the aircraft. Whereas if you're in an aircraft with a, um, a, a glass cockpit, a, 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 a good modern glass cockpit, then... Um, it does a better job of building the picture for you. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it builds the picture for you that you would other have to, otherwise have to build inside your mind. Now, one of the, one of the risks of uh, the glass cockpit is sometimes instructors have launched with steam gauge airplanes with the idea of I'm just going to explain everything to my learning pilot while we're in the air flying around, which in itself is not a great idea, but um, it can kind of be done. With a glass cockpit airplane, you really can't do that because there's too much botanology to learn, too much to learn about where you look for this, where you look for that. Uh, this kind of thing will have a round dial in electronic format. This kind of thing will have a vertical tape. Uh, here's how you interpret them, and here's where you, how you change things and where you find things. And um, uh, that really has to be learned on the ground one way or another, either through uh, a, a training course or sitting in the airplane with uh, power on it and, and treating the airplane itself like a flight simulator, uh, whichever uh, you want to do, but you really have to do it on the ground. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I know that even today when I get into um, a steam gauge airplane, um, all most of the CAP airplanes have, have transitioned over now to G1000s and, and others. Um, so there's not that many steam gauges anymore, but for the ones that are, I st I'll tell you, I still have a hard time wrapping, like I have an, old, an older style HSI, you know, I still have a hard time um, moving back to that and, and getting the, the visual representation of where I am. Um, yeah. If, so, yeah, glass yeah. cockpit does a better job of the HSI than, than the mechanical one does. Yeah. Yeah. And now even with the steam gauges, I know that uh, a lot of us have moved over to the electronic flight bags, right? Like Garmin Pilot or Foreflight. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's really been helpful too. Um, but it just got to, got everybody's got to keep their eyes out the windows, you know, when they're not in the clouds, keep their eyes out the window still. Um, all right. So jump master, his question was actually more for you guys from your, uh, from the King schools. So, you know, as you guys, like you said, you guys have been doing this now for, you know, pretty much 40 years now. So, which is incredible. Um, and you've been doing your video, you know, for a long time for most of that. Um, as you've been doing that, you know, and you see the current group of students that are coming up and they all have, you know, their, their iPhones or their whatever, their Android phones, they're attached to their eyeballs, right? You can't get them away from, right, from all the digital media, um, you know, as opposed to the, the quote unquote boomer generation, right? Which I think I'm getting kind of close to, uh, but the quote unquote boomer generation, uh, you know, for the older pilots, you and your school, what have you, um, how has that really challenged you and how you're doing your uh, training? Or have you found that your training is really kind of the same? Well, a lot of the principles of flying are the same. Um, 
but, but I really believe when when people started using iPads in the cockpit, flight instructors used to say, uh, should I allow my student to use an iPad in the cockpit? And um, my reaction to it is you should require your student mm. to use an iPad in the cockpit because it's such a powerful tool and they need to know how to use it and they need to know how to not get distracted by it. And I think it's a, I think the iPads are a powerful tool. Uh, Be because cockpit. when that student gets their certificate and goes out on their own, what's the first thing they're going to do? They're going <laughs> to strap an iPad right. to their leg. They, they need to know the advantages, but also the disadvantages. And there are some significant right. ones uh, in terms of power and making sure that the charts you want really are downloaded and you're not looking at them online where you can't see them once you're in the air. Right. Uh, but, but yes, John, I agree totally with John. One thing I will add from a training standpoint is that it, it, the, in general, the designated pilot examiners that are going to give uh, a private, a, an instrument, a commercial check ride will require the applicant to have multiple backups, whether the backups are paper, uh, which they kind of prefer, mm -hmm. or additional iPads, iPhones, uh, whatever. Um, I've had a number of uh, designated pilot examiners come to me and say, or, or that I've talked to say, and ask them about this, say, if the only thing they bring to the check ride is an iPad, you can be sure that that iPad is going to fail uh, within about the first hour of the on check, check ride, ride, on the check mm -hmm. ride, on the check ride. And one that we worked with when we did a, a, a DPE that we worked with when we updated our uh, private and instrument and commercial courses to the new air, uh, flight test to the uh, new airman certification standard said that she was giving a uh, private check ride to somebody and they had it did fine on the oral they were out at the airplane getting ready to fly the applicant put their iPad down on the wing of the airplane, oh, no. did something, and it just went whoosh right off the wing, just shattered. Oh. And that applicant had no backup, zero. And that was the end of the, uh, of the flight test. And these days, um, you know, flight tests are very hard to schedule. There's a shortage of DPEs, and the cost for a flight uh, test Private may be 600, but uh, a lot of places are charging 800 or 1,000 dollars for a flight test, regardless of the rating. You don't. You don't. You don't want, want to repeat. You, it. you don't want to flunk your check ride. Right? No. Correct. I thought. I thought you were going to tell me that they went and took off, and the, air, <laughs> the iPad flew off the wing on takeoff. Or well, something. that, that <laughs> could That's happen possible. also. Yeah, I'm glad it happened on the ground of the the ramp, <laughs> not on the runway. Um, although I'm sure that was an expensive lesson. You know, it is amazing, you know, people that aren't used to, if they're only used to doing little half hour to 45 minute flights or hour long flights, they go do that cross that first solo cross country that you mentioned about that, the power of the battery. People don't realize that, you know, that iPad may last, you know, seven to eight hours, um, on the ground when you're watching YouTube videos, but when that thing's using GPS and it's doing all the tracking, that battery doesn't last all that long. Um, so you definitely have to think about power. It doesn't last as long, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's alternatives like plugging into aircraft power with a mm -hmm. cigarette lighter or carrying external um, heavy batteries to plug mm -hmm. the iPad mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. There's ways to handle a it. Lot, a lot of people call um, uh, iPad batteries bricks. You just, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's also good to know, too, that um, a, lot of, a lot of folks don't realize is that if you have four flight or, or Garmin Pilot, um, if you want to have a second, like if you want to have your phone, um, they, don't, they don't require you to have a second subscription. So your primary subscription on your iPad or whatever device you're using, um, that will run you as well on your phone. So if you have an emergency, yes. yeah. you can switch over to your phone. I was actually in a flight um, about a week and a half ago 
and they had a problem up in front. I was actually in the back seat. I'm almost never in the back seat. It feels weird for me to be in the back seat. But um, they had uh, somebody was working on their instrument and they had a CFI with them and they totally got confused and they were trying to use their, um, their, their iPad and it totally just bombed on them for some reason. Um, and then they had um, a 650, I think it was, on the dash and they didn't really know how to do a hold pattern. Um, but I was doing it on my iPhone. <laughs> Um, in the back, I was keeping track of what they were doing and hand to hand them my iPhone for it. So yeah, definitely have those backups. Those things fail when you don't want them to. Yeah, they certainly do. Um, let's see here. I got this one from Mike New York. I'm assuming his name is Mike and he's from New York. Um, now for having been involved in the professional quality training videos for as long as you guys have, you know, with YouTube and so many other ways for people to create, um, you know, um, new videos um, to help, you know, do you have any recommendations for those folks to create safe, legal, but yet still engaging content for aviation? Is that Mike's question? That was Mike's question. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, um, could you say the question one more yeah, time? Yeah, I probably, I read it as he, as he wrote it. So I think what he's saying is, you know, with, with uh, YouTube, right? You can, it's so much easier now to create a video than, it, than say right. it used to be. And so with so many people out there creating videos, do you have any recommendations for those folks on, on how to create safe, legal, and engaging videos? Carefully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. We, we spend a lot of effort uh, making sure that we are correct on the videos and that they're current. Uh, and that we spend off on an awful lot of time uh, making sure they're clear, simple, and fun. And uh, uh, so that uh, that they uh, uh, this, so that they're uh, correct, that they're that they're current, uh, that they're complete, um, and it's not as easy to make them make things clear and simple and fun as it is just to to do one without without any preparation. Now, if he was asking about alternatively, how do you do it safely? Um, we spend um, about how you get don't have an accident. Is that what you're right. saying? Right. Uh, we spend a lot of time pre-planning when we're going to do a video, planning where we're going to be flying, um, what's the airspace around, uh, what what's the traffic situation uh, with other aircraft going to be. Um, we don't ever do something like that on an impromptu basis because that's how you get into trouble. And um, we put a lot of focus on making sure that the cameras are positioned where they're not going to be blocking our ability to see and avoid other aircraft. So uh, there's a lot of that kind of stuff that needs to go into it. If you're going to be taking video in the aircraft, because um, I believe there have been some number of pilots that the FAA has taken to task mm -hmm. when they looked at the video that was proudly posted on YouTube and said, mm, you know, that looks a little bit uh, risky to us. Yeah, it, there, it, it takes a lot of preparation and, and video, doing video is very distracting. And mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a real issue of risk management. Now, and this wasn't one of his questions, but I'm just curious for myself from hearing that. So when, when you guys are doing you know, the videos in the aircraft, do you specifically have like, um, when you plan them out, is there typically somebody in the airplane that's just as responsible for the video? And then this way that allows the pilot to just stay focused on the flying of the airplane? Um, generally, yes. The, um, <coughs> uh, we have someone who's a visual observer who's looking outside the window and seeing what's going on. And, and, uh, uh, and, and at when, when we're the pilot and we're uh, talking to the camera, uh, we're, re we're still pilot command and we're responsible for the flight of the aircraft. So um, as John said, making video is very distracting. And you know if you just put a camera on to show over the nose and this is a pretty flight or pretty landing, that's one thing. But if you're going to be talking to the camera while you're doing whatever flying you're going to be doing, uh, that gets a lot more problematical. And yes, we do have, as John says, a visual observer on board, and we've got uh, somebody else also on board 
who's handling all the technical issues about uh, the cameras, the audio, and all that stuff, so that um, we as pilot in command and on-camera instructor can at least minimize the number of things we have to uh, juggle. Good teaching requires a lot of preparation so that you know what you're going to say and how you're going to illustrate it. Yeah, I always try to tell people that uh, for, for me, for a 15-minute lesson, it's about eight hours of work to put together yeah, 15 a lot, minutes. A lot of preparation. Yep. Um, I got, I think, two or possibly three questions left uh, prior, prior to you guys doing the presentation. So, so we have Ryan Short um, here. So he wanted to know what you feel the interaction is going to be with general aviation and drones. And also he was interested because they have the commercial drone certification now. He wanted to know if King, um, you know, King Schools had or was planning on having a training program for, I think it's a part 117? 107. 107, 107. And, and we do, we do. And, uh, uh, and we've, we've done uh, tens of thousands of students for the Drone 107 course. Um, the, uh, the, the FAA, I, and I, I believe the FAA has done a pretty good job of managing this. And, uh, and, and the FAA has allowed people to fly unmanned aircraft uh, but they've done it. They've got regulations that keep people out of the other other the manned aircraft's airspace, and 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 they want to make sure that the people are knowledgeable about the manned aircraft airspace. And I I, I think they've done a good job. And I think that the, it, I think the drones will wind up bringing more pilots to general aviation. We've already seen in our company a number of people taking manned aircraft courses that uh, previously had taken the uh, drone part 107 test from us, had not previously been pilots, um, started flying drones commercially, uh, spent more time around the airport, thought it looked like fun, took a course, it was fun for them, and then there they were on their way and having a good time. Yeah, I think you guys are dead on. Um, I think it's a wonderful gateway, you know, for people that may not have thought, you know, oh, I'm going to be a pilot and think about how hard that is. And then they kind of get a taste of it. Um, right. That's the way the FAA is treating it. The FAA is making it so that people get the knowledge they need to do it safely. Yeah, that's great. And it's good to hear that you have that course. Um, I, I'll try, I'm going to try to put a link directly to that course because I know a lot of my students in Civil Air Patrol, a lot of them fly drones. Um, and yeah. many of them have asked about that. So I'll make sure I put a specific link to that in there. That's okay. Great. That's great. Um, let's see here. So the, let's see. So John, one of the questions I got from a gentleman named Half Fast, um, he asked the question that you had an issue with um, your medical. Um, and, you know, I, I also, I was actually grounded for about six months um, trying to work with Cami. And so he thought it might be interesting since that seems to be an issue that's becoming more and more in general aviation. What was the issue that you had, and how did you work through it? Well, the issue that I had is that the um, FAA didn't agree with my uh, neurologists who uh, felt that I was safe, and the FAA uh, didn't, and they didn't follow the advice of the neurologists. Because you had had a lapse of consciousness. I had a lapse of consciousness, and, and their neurologist said, you're fine. They did... Uh, they did uh, uh, some, batteries of tests. Yeah, they did lots of tests, and they found my brain. Um, <laughs> it was uh, there. <laughs> and it, it took a lot of work, but they found it. Um, and so um, the the and the thing that's uh, uh, disappointing about it is that the FAA is very very uh, slow at responding to people, and uh, uh, they just uh, they 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 uh, they change your life. And uh, and they don't do a good job of responding, and uh, it's it's a disappointment from that standpoint. Now, do you think um, now that you know for the group that are uh, interested in this conversation, that, that group specifically with FAA is is called CAMI, um, and the folks I worked with at CAMI for my thing, they were super good. I really appreciated their efforts, but the similar exact same thing you just said. It was just really, really long in between communications. Um, I right. had a really, I had a really minor thing. I took just, I took a medication for a reason that wasn't on, like the medication was on their you can't do it list. 
and I didn't know it. Um, so there's a lesson there to, you know, if you're gonna take new medication, review that with your AME. Um, it's, it's awful hard to find that can't do it list. Mm -hmm. Which is a good reason for people who fly or are thinking about flying to become members of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association because I don't know that their list is, quote, official, mm -hmm. but they keep a running list based on their interactions with CAMI of what's allowed, what's not allowed, uh, is it allowed unrestricted or with these qualifications and so on. And, and that's a big heads up, but you're exactly right. New medications really uh, ought to be cleared uh, either through AOPA or uh, your AME, uh, just so you don't get in trouble un unknowingly. Have we right. turned our air conditioning yes. back on? Okay. Um, oh, you guys, you guys have to have air conditioning. You're so you're you're, you're over in California, so <laughs> I guess that makes <laughs> sense. Um, a lot of the countries like air conditioning. <laughs> what are we talking about? Um, well, we've got we've got a lot, a lot of sun here. Oh, it's and, coming and through the window. A couple of lights on. Uh, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Um, all right. So the last question that we've got is actually from from me. Um, this is actually a two part question. So the first the first one is um, because of COVID, there's a lot of us that are teaching remotely, and I'm hoping you guys can hear me because it looks like you froze again, unfortunately. Up oh, there you are. Um, okay. Let me. I'll restart that. It froze real quick. Here. Okay. Great. Um, so it's a two part question for me, but they're not related. Um, so the first question is for those of us, because of COVID, we're, we're having to teach remotely. Um, and do you guys have any recommendations for teachers, uh, or individuals that are home that are trying to teach, um, with video? Is there any recommendations? You've been teaching via video for so long. Do you have any recommendations for all these new people trying to teach via video? You're talking about uh, school teachers at regular schools? School teachers, college teachers, yep. No, it's the same, it's the same thing. You just simply uh, get prepared and, and, and do your homework and, and uh, uh, pay attention to people. I would say that, um, that the preparation uh, changes a little bit because by not having the the physical closeness, mm -hmm. uh, you you have to work a little harder at getting interesting engagement as opposed to just engagement for uh, for some silly reason to know that they're still on the other end of that Zoom call or Skype call or, or whatever. Yeah, they haven't fallen asleep on you. Um, right. All right. So last question I've got for you. So. Um, and this one is for both of you. Um, and that is every, I got this question like five or six times. People wanted to know what are the best methods for flying with a co-pilot who's also your spouse? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we um, uh, are both flight instructors. And one of the problems is if you're flying with your uh, spouse, who is also a flight instructor, um, there is a very strong tendency for the pilot who is uh, uh, not flying, who is the co-pilot, uh, to, to instruct, to give unsolicited instruction <laughs> to, uh, to the, the captain. And, and, and there's a tendency for the captain to not appreciate, it, appreciate the unsolicited instruction. And so uh, there can be a conflict with each other is that the co-pilot's giving, uh, the, uh, the flight instructor is giving instruction and the um, captain is ignoring the instruction. And it's a bad dynamic. It's, it's, it's very bad. And then, so we were telling, I was telling a friend how difficult Martha was. <laughs> and, and he said, uh, well, I, I can fix that problem for you, John. And, and I, can, I can fix it for you in one word. And I said, no, no, you have no idea how much Martha resists uh, this uh, instruction from me, and uh, he says, "No, I can fix it, and I can fix it in one word." I said, "You're not going to fix this in one word." He said, "I can fix it in one word." I said, "Okay, what's the word?" He says, "The word is captain," mm -hmm. because if you, if she's captain of the aircraft, and you have something you want to say to her, you call her captain, and that tells her that that you respect her authority, uh, that you're not trying to take her power away from her, and 
and it, and it tells her uh, that she should pay attention to you. Um, and, and so uh, we did that, and, uh, and, and Martha, what I would call her captain, or, or she would call me captain, the other would, the other would pay attention, and, uh, and it, says, it says, listen, I'm not trying to take your authority away from you, but here's some information you're going to want to know. And, and, and it worked. And it's her obligation, or the other pilot's obligation, when they're when they're a captain, to pay it, to solicit the input from the other pilot, and uh, and, uh, and and be responsive to it, and to seek it out. And uh, we would do that, and it would work. And the arguments went away. Um, uh, we were the pilot flying uh, would listen to the input. And uh, and w and the, and the co-pilot would do a better job of giving the input. And uh, we had two rules that the co-pilot had to follow. Uh, rule number one: uh, they're not allowed to give you their opinion, mm -hmm. they, it's, but you, you can give them information. So I could, I was allowed to say to Martha, Martha, you're 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 low and you're below glide path. Because that's information. What I was not allowed to say is, Martha, you're too damn low. <laughs> because that was my opinion. So mm -hmm. I was not allowed to do that. So once I learned those rules that I had to give her information, and, uh, and I was not allowed to give my opinion, and I did it respectfully, and, and her rule was that she had to, to pay attention to what I said. Um, it worked very, very well, and we do it today. And uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to get in our airplane, and we're going to fly to the East Coast. and. Uh, uh, I'll be her co-pilot and she'll be the captain and it goes just beautifully. But the key there is the second thing <clears throat> that John said, and that is respect. Because you can't share a cockpit, <clears throat> regardless of your certificate levels, uh, with any kind of participation or um, lack of drama, if you will, if you don't each have respect for uh, the other pilot right. and for for their opinions and the information that they're giving you. So it, it all starts with one respect and, as you said, John, clear communication. And, and it, it, it helps uh, on the relationship when I say, I want to make it clear, she's only a little bit better pilot. <laughs> and, and, and I can say that honestly and very comfortably because Martha is very, <laughs> sorry about the cough, she's very situationally aware. She's way out ahead of the aircraft and knows where we are, what's going on, and what's going to happen next. And, uh, and it makes her a better pilot. That's, those are the characteristics to me of a good pilot, is they're situationally aware and they know what they're doing. Well, I so, want, go well, ahead. I, was say, I want to say thank you very much. That was a really great answer. I expected you to say the one word was the intercom button. The word the word captain is, is terribly important on it and and uh, paying paying uh, because it shows respect. paying attention to her with civility and respect. I'm going to actually I'm going to bookmark that answer because um, while I actually I thought that they were joking when they asked the question. Your answer to uh -huh. it, I think, is actually really helpful for a lot of people. So it's a big issue, Bob, for a lot of people flying together. A lot of spouses, but also um, uh, parents and children, mm -hmm. uh, siblings, uh, good friends, anyone that that where they want to fly together places and have fun in the cockpit and share some of the uh, the duties and the um, uh, activity because that's what makes it more fun. Um, the two real criteria are respect and good communication. You know, in, in civil air patrol, we follow a lot of crew resource management, right? Like, um, you know, even though we're flying Cessnas, you know, we treat huh. it like big iron. And, um, you know, and you will see it's an interesting dynamic because you'll see the pilot, you know, the, 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 the pilot may have, say, 300 hours, right? A pretty green pilot. And the person <laughs> sitting in the right seat um, just for that flight, they may be a 5,000 hour airline pilot, you know? Um, right. And, and yeah. it is interesting. We actually have training on, to make sure that, listen, if you're, if you're the pilot, you're the pilot. 
And if you're, you may be the 5,000 hour airline pilot, but that, that respect is so important. Um, and how you talk to each other is so important. Um, so, all right. So those were, so thank you very much. Those were the questions that I had. Um, now I'm showing about, uh, give or take 10 to 12 minutes left. Is that enough time for you guys to do, um, the air safety presentation? Well, we, we've got an abbreviated version we can use and we can just talk a little bit about, and I think, I, I hope it's helpful. I, th I think it will be. Okay. okay great. And we, one of the things that we want to say is that general aviation pilots are not normal. And, and the reason we say that general aviation pilots are not normal is they put extraordinary effort in everything they do. And, uh, and so uh, flying is fun because it uses everything you've got. It uses all your aptitudes. It uses your mental capability. It uses your physical capability. It uses your emotional uh, capability. And it requires motivation and, and goal orientation. And, 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 you know, you would think goal orientation is a wonderful thing. But goal orientation is this desire to complete what you set out to do. And that's generally a good thing but in aviation it can be a, a risk factor excuse me and this is something that's particularly important to the civil air patrol because so much of the flying that uh, we all do uh, for the civil air patrol are missions of one sort or another and um, i think you mentioned earlier the mission for uh, distributing meals and distribute for the uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, distributing vaccine and and personal protective equipment, and and just the word mission in and of itself tends to make a pilot feel I can't cancel this, I can't change this. This is my mission. It's got to go off the way we planned it, and. That's not true. Um, there's a lot of ways to accomplish what you're trying to do without canceling, uh, but with modifications that uh, reduce the risk considerably. So because in general aviation, we don't have all the systems uh, that keep airline pilots safe, like um, dispatchers and, and the management and and um, uh, the, the kind of mentoring that uh, airline pilot unions do with the, uh, their, their members. Honest discussions about safety are particularly important to us in general aviation. But the problem is that in general aviation, our discussions about safety very often are not particularly helpful and not particularly insightful. And sometimes they can actually be counterproductive. Um, for instance, it, it's not uncommon when there's a major accident, an airline accident or, or sh uh, something really dramatic for people uh, in the transportation um, departments of the federal government to come out um, maybe the FAA administrator, maybe the Secretary of Transportation, and say, safety is our number one priority. There can be no compromise with safety. And that, those are nice phrases. They sound good. They make the, the non-aviation general public say, oh, that's wonderful. They're going to take <coughs> care of me. But... They, and they affirm a resolve to do better, but sayings like that are not and cannot uh, be true. And, and the reason is, um, if you fly an airplane, uh, moving the airplane and flying it means safety is your not, not your number one priority. If, if, if you flew the airplane, you're willing to take some form of risk because you can't start an engine without accepting some level of risk. So if we say things like safety is the number one priority, there can be no compromise with safety, what we're saying is intellectually dishonest. And, and those things actually s substitute for thoughtful discussion and, 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 thought, and substitute 
for um, how we, we can deal with things in the future. They, 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 it's, not, it's not a thoughtful discussion. And part of the problem is, depending on who's giving it and how they're doing it, safety advice in general aviation very, comes off, very often comes off as preachy. It comes off as smug and superior. Oh, I know how to do this and you don't. And it can, it can feel very demeaning to the recipient of it. And, but the biggest problem of it is it doesn't give any guidance on what to do. Too much of it just says, oh, you, you've got a bad attitude or something, but it doesn't tell you what to do. And so what, what you really want to do is identify risks and mitigate them, and, and it's risk management. They'll say, for instance, um, you failed at aeronautical decision making. Well, if you failed at aeronautical decision making, what do you do? Well, what you should be doing is identifying risks and mitigating them. Um, and, and they'll say you don't have judgment. Well, they, that doesn't give you any guidance about what to do. But the important thing to do is to identify and mitigate risks. And what you do is you have an ongoing habit that you continuously are thinking about risks and, uh, and mitigating them. And, and that's, those are the habits that, that keep you out of trouble. So what, what we basically say to people is you want to set as a, a very high value the use of clear and honest language when you're talking about risk management in aviation. And the way to think about it is, we think, safety is an outcome and risk management is how you get to that outcome that you want. So um, we, we think that, uh, that uh, you should break the risks uh, down into categories like the pilot, the aircraft, the environment, and the, the pressures that are on the pilot. Why, why, is it, why is a pilot being pressured to go on when they should stop? So just thinking about the risks and how you, how you mitigate them is, is the key to risk management. All right, I, actually, I, we have now hit the time and we need to quit. But Bob, thank you very much for doing such a good job of this. All right, well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate your time today. And um, we will talk to you in the future and hopefully uh, we get another Oshkosh and you guys are there. Hopefully I'll get to meet you in person. I'm six All foot right. eight, so I'll be hard to miss. So well, good to see it you. Sounds thanks, great. Thanks everybody. Stay thank out you. of the trees. <laughs> thank you. Have a great one. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. All right, everybody. That was John and Martha King. I uh, really do appreciate their time, um, you know, coming out and speaking with us here uh, for the general aviation community as well as for Civil Air Patrol. And I hope that you all got a chance to uh, to learn something. I actually, I, I really didn't expect such a great answer um, on the uh, how to how to fly with a spouse. Um, I thought that that was going to be kind of a throwaway joke question. Uh, that was actually a really informative answer. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, you want to watch more uh, content. Um, we are on Twitter at aerospace underscore live. Uh, we have this podcast. So pretty much what you're watching right now, we have the audio only of it. Uh, so in case you're working out, or if you're going for a walk or, you know, getting ready for a flight, you want to listen to these and, as opposed to watching them, you can look up aerospace dash live and that'll get you the podcast. Um, and almost all of our content is here on YouTube um, and that's youtube.com slash Robert Roberts. Uh, again, I am with Civil Air Patrol. If you are interested in learning more about what we do with Civil Air Patrol, you can go to GoCivilAirPatrol.com. With that, I hope you all have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed that video. If you did, please do me a favor. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content. Up here on the left-hand side, you're going to see another video from our, uh, this playlist. And if you click down here, you're going to see another video on our channel. Hope you guys all have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.